he takes us through um, things, through times and seasons and um, things that we often don't understand. They don't may not make sense to us, but uh, um, he'll use it for his purpose. And he doesn't author everything that, that takes place in our lives, but he'll use it. Can I get an amen? God is not the author of every bad thing that happens to you. Please don't blame him for that. Uh, he gets enough uh, of a bad rap for storms and things like that. Call them acts of God. Um, a hurricane will come through and level something and they'll call it an act of God and he gets all the blame. Um, bad things happen and he gets all the blame. Good things happen and people forget all about him. Amen. But um, he, he doesn't uh, author the bad things that happen. The earth is under a curse. Uh, ever since uh, Adam and Eve uh, committed high treason against God and disobeyed him, um, a curse came on the earth. And uh, uh, there's a lot that goes along with that. But but um, we need to understand that he's not the author of all the bad things that happen to us, but he can use them. Amen? So he uses those things to shape us and the lives that uh, he's called us to live, the things, the plans, the purposes, the pursuits that he has intended for us. Uh, and we need to make certain that uh, we're laying hold of that and walking it out. Uh, but but it, it takes patience, right? It takes patience. There's times that, you know, the Bible says, I think it's in uh, Hebrews chapter 6, that that after Abraham had patiently endured, he obtained the promise, right? There's a whole lot of time that transpired between the first time that God said, uh, changed his name from Abram to Abraham and give him part of his name. And then he took Abraham's name, became the God of Abraham. And there's a whole lot of time that took place between the time that God made covenant with Abraham and the time that Isaac was born, right? Uh, a lot of time transpired. And there was a great deal of time, at least 400 years, uh, that transpired before Israel became a, a nation, so to speak, and God delivered them out of Egypt. But, but there's time that takes place. This is, this is not a from a pit to the palace sermon, but I, I just want to encourage you to, to be patient in the process that God has you in because uh, there's purpose behind it. Amen? You know, he, the Bible says in, uh, in 2 Timothy chapter 2, let me get this here, 2 Timothy chapter 2, um, verse 12, that, that if we endure, we shall also reign with him. If we deny him, he'll deny us. But if we endure, we shall also reign with him. We're, his plans for us are, is to be overcomers, uh, more than conquerors. Uh, his plans for us, we're destined to reign, right? Uh, if we endure, we'll reign with him. And so that's the plan that he has for us. That's the, the, the opinion, if you will, that we need to get hold of for ourselves so that we can walk that out, uh, live that out, and be, again, be the people that he's destined us to be. But again, it takes patience. Uh, Hebrew, uh, excuse me, Romans 12, 12 says, Rejoice in hope, be patient in affliction, be persistent in prayer. We need to be patient in affliction and persistent in prayer. And Jesus, when he was, uh, he was warning his disciples of the signs of the times, the signs of the end times in Luke 21, in verse 19, he said that... Um, well, King James is how it initially went in and said, in your patience, possess ye your souls. Anybody ever uh, read that? In your patience, we don't like to talk about patience, but we're going to talk about it just a little bit this morning before we can move on. But um, in your patience, possess ye your souls. That's the same word um, that's, that's used in uh, uh, Hebrews chapter 10 um, when he says you have need of patience. And it's talking about a, a, a constancy, a steadfastness. The Amplified actually says, by your steadfastness and patient endurance, you shall win the true life of your souls. Uh, the true life of your souls. So by steadfastness and constant endurance, you'll win the true life of your souls. You'll, you'll bear out what it is that God intends you to bear out and be the people that he intends you to be. Don't let other people deter you uh, from your walk. Don't let them dictate how you live your life. And by that, that's the big and the small. That's the, don't let other people influence you in life-changing decisions, but it's also don't let other people influence you when you're driving down the highway, right? Don't let them change you from the person that you're called to be into some other person that you're encountering. Be, be a thermostat, not a thermometer, right? And you got awful quiet, so I'll assume that you all had a pleasant drive here this morning in the rain. <laughs> Amen. Uh, don't, don't let emotions control your decision making. Be patient. Uh, you know, that's when, you, when we're talking about this, uh, patience and self-denial, um, it, it is entry-level Christianity. Anybody ever heard that? It's entry-level Christianity. Because Jesus said, if anyone would come after me, let him first deny himself, take up his cross daily, and follow me, right? Self-denial is entry-level Christianity. We don't like to think about that or even talk about that, but uh, 
you know, we fast here uh, periodically on a regular basis. We fast and we deny ourselves. But self-denial also is born out in resisting the... I, I talked last week about the Hawaiian good luck symbol, didn't I? That can be self-denial. <laughs> Believe it. Anyway, I'll, I'll leave that alone. I will. I'll leave it alone. And those of you who didn't hear about the Hawaiian good luck symbol are wondering what in the world I'm talking about. Um, emotions make wonderful servants but terrible masters. So don't be governed by your emotions. Don't let them be the decision makers in your life. Be patient. Um, be kind. Be, but don't let your emotions dictate how it is or the decisions that you make or how it is that you live your life. Uh, if you do, you'll be up here on the mountaintop one second, and then five minutes later, you'll be down there in the valley wondering what in the world has happened to you and what's going on. Because McDonald's has taken seven minutes to get your order to the drive through window. <laughs> Amen. And it, you're angry, and you're beside yourself. You're over in the passenger seat wondering how in the world could God do this to you? Because after all, I'm a Christian. My Big Mac should not take this long. Amen. Amen. Uh, in Hebrews chapter 6, it says, uh, um, before it says, after Abraham had patiently endured, he obtained the promises, be not slothful, but imitate those who th faith and patience obtained the promise. But I, I want you to understand that it's all in his timing. It's all in his timing. And that's, that's kind of what I want to talk about a little bit this morning is that um, everything in Ecclesiastes chapter 3 verse 1 says, to everything there is a season, a time for every purpose under heaven. It goes on to say, a time to be born, a time to die. Time to plant, to pluck up what is planted, time to kill, and time to heal. Uh, there, there's, there's seasons, times, purposes, and activities in the, the mind of God, if you will, that he has ordained and established. And, and he says that there's a time, a purpose, and, and, and uh, or, excuse me, times and seasons for every purpose under heaven. We need to understand that, uh, that we can discern the signs and purposes uh, and seasons that God has intended for us. And it, it's important for, for the church at large, but also for us individually and, and uh, culturally or in society. Uh, can, you, can you pull up uh, 1 Chronicles chapter 12, verse 32? 1 Chronicles chapter 12, verse 32. Everybody doing good? Yeah. We got a small group this morning because of Nestor. Sure, it's not the sound guy's fault, it's Nestor's fault. It's the, the other Nestor. Was that, yeah. Uh, hey, don't get him focused on Concarne either. Um, of the sons of Issachar who had understanding of the times to know what Israel ought to do, their chiefs were 200 and all their brethren, all their brethren uh, were at their command. Of the sons of Issachar who had understanding of the times to know what Israel ought to do, their chiefs were, it's, it's numbering, this is uh, when David was numbering the tribes, uh, the, the military. It, it says in verse 32, of the sons of Issachar who had understanding of the times to know what Israel ought to do, their chiefs were 200 and all their brethren were at their command. Their, the, the name Issachar <clears throat> means reward, compensation, benefit, or salary. The name Issachar means re, uh, reward, compensation, benefit, or salary. So these were people who lived their lives or had a lifestyle that was a reward or a benefit to the, those around them, specifically to the nation of Israel. They had, they had um, all their brethren were at their command because they had understanding of the times to know what Israel ought to do. They had understanding of the, of the times to know what Israel ought to do. Praise God. Amen. So when you understand that these people, um, they lived a life that was a reward or a benefit to other, there, there's, an, there's an Issachar anointing, if you will. And so our sensitivity to God is a benefit or a reward, reward to others. Uh, when we're able to hear the voice of God, to obey the leading of the Holy Spirit and impact the lives of the world around us, we're a benefit to other people. Uh, we often hear the term that we're his hands and feet in, in the earth, right? Anybody ever heard that? But you're also the voice of God oftentimes because the Bible says in, in Amos that surely the Lord will do nothing unless he first, in the earth unless he first revealed it through the mouth of his servants, the prophets, right? God doesn't do something in the earth without first revealing it. That's why we have the Old Testament um, is born out. That I don't know how many prophecies, but there's thousands of prophecies in the Old Testament and in the New Testament as well. But in the Old Testament that have been born out in, in the life and birth of Jesus and the, the happenings of Israel, there's so much prophecy yet to take place. Uh, if 
we don't recognize the day and the hour in which we live, we'll get caught up in something and get distracted and if not deceived and led completely astray. But we have the opportunity as the people of God to walk in this Issachar anointing, if you will, and be a blessing to the people, to the world around us. A benefit, a reward, a salary. Are you, are you following me? So when we're talking about this, uh, uh, the sons of Issachar who had understanding to know the times, this, uh, now keep in mind that to everything there is a season, a time for every purpose under heaven, a time to be born, so... Every purpose under heaven, there's a time that God has intended that uh, to, to happen or to take place. So we're able to pick up things uh, in the spirit by listening to the voice of God, by getting in the presence of God. And as a result, we're able to impact the lives of the people around us. So um, it's being in relationship with him. Uh, being the people of God. And I've talked about this before, that, that that is one common thing throughout all generations and dispensations that God required of his people was to hear his voice. He required that of every generation in, in the book of Exodus when uh, he's leading the children of Israel out of Egypt and he takes them to Sinai. He says that he has called them out to himself and this is where he says that they're going to be a, a kingdom of priests, right? This is shortly before Moses ascends down, or he's at, on, on the mountain and he's going to go down and God says, you tell the people that they're to, to be a kingdom of priests for me, right? But, and, and, and that they're to hear his voice and obey him. Right? This is in, uh, I think it's in Exodus 18. But, but it's a common theme throughout all scripture and in all time where man is concerned that we're to hear the voice of God. And so when we're talking about, uh, I, I called it an is, Issachar anointing, it is imperative that the people of God, Jesus said, my sheep know my voice and the voice of another they'll not follow. Knowing his voice implies there's certainly implication there that uh, they hear his voice, right? You, you can't know it if you can't hear it. But what I'm telling you is we have to be able to hear the voice of God. You have to be able to get into his presence, hear his voice, and then in turn affect or impact. See, we get so caught up sometimes on how it's all about us, right? I know you're thinking, no, but it's all about us. It is. It's all, I've said this so many times, but nobody thinks about you as much as you think about you. You know, and, and people... <laughs> I was telling my lovely wife yesterday, everybody gets caught up in their own, it wasn't in regard to her necessarily, but everybody gets, I need to be nice. <laughs> I heard a 90-something year old couple say just this past week that the, their, their key, they thought the key to a happy and long marriage was being nice to one another. There's a whole lot of truth in that. Uh, but they were both 90, they had been married for 70-something years, I think. 90-something years old, yeah, Amen. So I'm going to be nice to my wife. But we were talking about, we were talking about how, you know, people, we're, we're consumed in essence oftentimes with how we look. What, it's, the, it's the I want, I think, I feel, right? I want, I think, I feel. And we're consumed with it. We're about everything about us and we forget that there are nearly 8 billion other people out there. And, uh, you know, as much as I like to think that I'm the apple, oh, I'm the apple of his eye, but I'm his favorite out of all of us 8 billion, um, you know, it's not all about me. When coming into the kingdom, we need to understand that and recognize it because uh, Jesus said that if you'll lose your life, you'll find it, right? If you'll lay down your life, you'll find it, but if you refuse to, you'll lose it. Amen. I didn't get that quite right, but, but hang with me. So when we're talking about being able to hear the voice of God and understand the, the times and seasons and, and the activities, if you will, uh, when you're talking about planting, uh, sowing and reaping, planting, uh, these are activities that God has assigned a time and a purpose for, and it's up to us to be able to recognize what it is that God uh, is doing and what he intends to do in the earth. We can hear his voice um, and do what it is that he's called us to do, be the people he's called us to be. And when we don't discern the times, when we don't understand what it is that he desires to do. Um, now remember, we were talking just a few weeks back about, about that we're not supposed to be led by signs, right? You all remember me talking about that? Anybody? And, and I talked about how the, the religious leaders, 
they knew the word. Matter of fact, they, oftentimes they would have to, to memorize huge chunks, if not the entirety of the Pentateuch. That's the uh, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. And, and so when, when Jesus came, they would often ask him, they would say, show us a sign. We'll look a little bit more at this in a, in a couple of minutes, but they would say, show us a sign. And because they knew that there was a corresponding sign with the arrival of the Messiah. The corresponding sign with the arrival of the Messiah was that he would be a conquering king. This is in their, their eyes. Um, and that's true. Jesus came first as a suffering servant. Next time he comes back, he'll be a conquering king. I've said this before, that if you listen to, uh, it's called Arut Sheva. It's a Jewish national radio. It's kind of like NPR. Um, but it's Jewish national radio. They often will refer to, and this is in their national radio, <clears throat> they'll often refer to the coming of Messiah. And if, you're, if you don't understand, uh, well, anyway, it sounds like, hey, they're thinking just like we're thinking, but if you don't understand, they're looking for him to come the first time. They're looking for him to come as conquer. We're both looking for him to come as conquering king, the Hebrew people and the Christians. Uh, we're both looking for him to con uh, come as conquering king, but they missed him the first time, right? But they knew their Bible, so when he came, he was performing miracles and, and all these mighty works, and they were testament to the fact that he had come from the Father, and yet they still didn't recognize who he was, because they not only did they not have the anointing of Issachar, they had no relationship with the father. Zero. And because they didn't have any relationship with him, they failed to recognize who was there in their midst, the, the Messiah. And, and likewise, remember me talking about Simeon in the temple? And when uh, after the days of purification, which would have been 33 days for Mary, is this ringing any bells? So, so after the days of purification, uh, uh, they took Jesus to present him in the temple, right? 33, he's 33 days old, and Simeon comes running up to him out of all these people, hundreds of people uh, in the temple. Simeon goes up to him, and he picks him up, and he says, thank you, Father, I have seen the salvation of Israel, right? And, and, and so Simeon, led by the Spirit of God, can recognize Jesus when he's 33 days old, and they couldn't recognize him when he was 33 years old after performing, performing miracles and and signs and wonders and all these things because they had no relationship with the Father, right? Amen. Amen. Somebody asked me not too long ago about, uh, <clears throat> no, I remember when it was, it was a, a, about what happens to people who never get to hear the gospel, the people in the farthest corners of the earth. Well, I believe God reveals himself to people. Amen. He reveals himself. Well, uh, now, think about this. Was Job an Israelite? I'll answer the question for you. No, he wasn't. He was much older. Uh, he was... Uh, the wealthiest man in the East, this was before Abraham's time. Job wasn't an Israelite, yet he had an intimate relationship with God. What about Enoch? Enoch walked with God and he was not for God took him, right? Uh, you can have a relationship with God. Jesus, uh, anyway, I don't want to get too far off in the weeds here. But, but what I want you to understand is relationship is available. Intimacy with the Father. And we come to the Father through the Son. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and life. But if you understand that relationship is available to humanity, you, you reject him in one capacity or another, and that's why you're separated from him, or you accept him in one capacity or another. Any, anyway, that's a sermon for a different day. But, but understand this, that we have opportunity to get in, we've been given access. And, and the, the age, the dispensation in which we live, we've been given tremendous access into the presence of God. We enter in by the blood of the Lamb, right? Amen. So we enter into his presence by the blood of the lamb, but, but he's given us, he, it's like in the, it says in the book of uh, 1 Corinthians that all these mysteries were hidden for us. It doesn't say from us. It says they're hidden for us. It's in uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 2. It says these mysteries were hidden for us, not from us. And, and it's up to us to get in his presence and discover these mysteries as they're unfolding before us. We have, as a people, we have an ability to enter into the presence of God, to hear his voice, not only for us, but for a lost and dying world. And I'm going to tell you something. You, you want to shake things up. You want to change things in a huge way. You begin to share. You, you get in his presence and you discover the heart of God and you begin to share that with the world around you and it will shake things up in a big way. When he begins to give you words of wisdom and words of knowledge, when he begins to reveal things to you in a fantastic... See, see we, we get, again, we get this idea that it's all about us. And, and I know God loves you and he wants to bless you and he wants to bless you more than you want to be blessed. And sometimes it's hard for us to even wrap our minds around that because we want to be blessed really bad, right? 
We, we are blessed and we typically think in terms of money, but we want to be blessed really bad. And you think, Pastor, I want to be blessed really, really bad. Well, I understand that you do, but God wants to bless you more than you really, really want to be blessed. He does. He, but he says, my brethren, I wish above all things thou mayest prosper and be in health even as your soul prospers. There's a contingency there, the prosperity of the soul. But that, again, that's a sermon for a different day. What you must understand is that everything, it, it, we can talk in terms of body, that all, we have all this equipment, we have all these different features of the body that's, that's for the body with all, right? You have all these different gifts, these different assets that we bring to the body, and, and, and it's for the profit of all. When we're talking about hearing the voice of God, you hear the voice of God for yourself. You, it's kind of like, and I've said this before too, that <clears throat> he gives us gifts that we are to operate in. We have to be careful that we don't focus on the gift, solely on the gift. What's happening in the church now is kind of a travesty because what happens is you, you get people living one way and they're talking about living another way. And, and they have a gift, so we think that, well, this, he's an awesome preacher, he's an awesome teacher, he's an awesome singer or worship leader, and then we get distracted with the gift, and their gift doesn't line up with the lifestyle that they're living. And as a result, we think that all we need to do is operate in our gift, and everything else will be okay. I'm telling you, without holiness, no one shall see God. Amen. Without holiness, no one shall see God. So don't be deceived into believing that all that's important is your gift because essentially what happens there is we hijack our own gift for our own benefit and it's for the profit with all. This isn't what my sermon is about today, but I want you to understand that we as a people, as the people of God, we have the ability to get into his presence and hear his voice, experience his goodness and turn and relate that to a lost and dying world. Now, and like I said before, if you want to see things get shaken up in a dramatic way, you start to operate in the power of God. And I'm telling you, folks, it's coming. It's coming. I have a promise that we are going to see revival in this house, in these outer banks. Amen. And it's going, I'm telling you, <clears throat> amen. That's certainly worth clapping about. Thank you, all five. No. <laughs> but... But understand this, that, that there's, there's something that's required before we get to the place where we're in his presence and turning and, and prophesying and raising the dead. If you're not spending time in his presence, getting to know his voice and know how it is that he leads and, and recognize what it is that he's calling us to do, if you're not doing that, then don't be surprised if you're not going to experience the rest of it. See, see it's like I said last week, we all want to see miracles, but nobody wants to be put in a position where you need a miracle, right? We all want to see these wonderful and fascinating things, but nobody wants to pay the price to... to I want to tell you, somebody, every time that you see a miracle, somebody has paid a price. They're, they're operating in the gifts of God. They're operating in, in, the, in the anointing. They're operating in faith. They're, somebody has paid a price for somebody. You might not know who it is. You might not have any idea. But somebody has paid a price for what has taken place. Jesus paid the ultimate price. But people, it's, it costs you something to get into the presence of God. And if we're not hearing the voice of God and we're not able to discern the times, the seasons, and, and, and the purposes of God as well as the activities, if we're not able to discern these, then it's going to cost us something in the other way, right? See, see we think we get all caught up in, in a, no matter which side of the political spectrum you fall on, we get all caught up in politics and we think that the politicians are the evil culprits who are responsible for everything that's taking place in society. We, and it got real quiet in here, didn't it? Pastor's talking about politics. Oh, no. It's the quickest way to empty a building. Politics, politicians, lawmakers do not shape culture, folks. Let me say that again. Politicians, lawmakers do not shape culture. They respond, they react to something that's taking place in culture, they respond, they legislate, they pass laws, they do things to prevent or to, to prop up, they respond to what's taking place in culture. They, they themselves do not shape culture. They respond to it. Are you listening? Now, even, um, we're talking about even secular culture. The, uh, outside the kingdom, they don't even shape secular culture. 
Do you know who shapes secular culture? Our artistic people, singers and songwriters and storytellers, movie makers. These are the people, I'm, I'm, I'm telling you the truth. These are the people that Hollywood and Nashville do far more to shape secular culture than, than Washington does. Do you know why? Because when, when you're speaking, when you're talking about uh, somebody who's, who's an artist, and, and, and this includes, it includes paintings. Have you ever seen the Mona Lisa? I mean, have you ever stopped and pondered a Monet or a, a, a wonderful work of art? Anybody? Uh, I, I'm, I'm telling you, it will register with you because there's a gift in operation. When you hear a song that, that goes to your heart, see, th th and that's the reason right there, because it reaches you on a level that passes this right here. So, and when I'm talking about artists that shape culture, it, it's, it circumvents this. It has nothing to do with intellect because truth goes straight to the heart and it passes the head. And I'm, I'm telling you the truth. So, truth, truth uh, uh, transforms whereas uh, uh, knowledge, uh, um, 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 my train derailed. Knowledge informs and truth transforms. There we go. Knowledge informs and truth transforms. So when you're talking about somebody who's a singer, has anyone, there was like two hands that went up when I was talking about a work of art, a painting. How about a song? Have you ever listened to a song? Or is there a song that you can be driving down the road and listening to and it just changes your whole perspective? I'm, I'm Christian or otherwise. That's like, uh, uh, <laughs> how about uh, Hank Williams Sr., I'm so lonesome I could cry. Anybody ever heard that song? I remember... B.C., before Christ, I remember B.C., when I would hear that song, and, and because I was, it, it registered with me on a very intimate level, because I was so lonesome I could cry. It's quiet in here. I, I, and, and so, when I would hear that song, but see, you know, he wrote that song because he was so lonesome he could cry. Amen. So when, when it hits here, it bypasses this and it's registering with you here. The truth of being so lonesome you can cry hits you in the heart, in the spirit, and it registers with you on an entirely different level. So when we're talking about people who shape culture, we're talking about people, you watch a movie. And, and this is why, folks, the Bible says to guard your heart with all diligence for out of it flow the issues of life. So when you're watching movies, I could, I could name some and, and not, don't raise any hands and please don't write me any letters. But, but when you're talking about Harry Potter and, and people operating openly with witchcraft, I'm telling you folks, it registers in you far more than you realize and you are subjecting yourself to something that you should not be any part of. My Bible says, uh, he said, that you'll not suffer a witch to live. Did you know that? Yes. That means a witch, you, you shouldn't even permit them to keep on living. They're to be put to death if they're practicing witchcraft in your community, right? It's real quiet in here. But we, when it comes to Harry Potter, we'll build an entire theme park for Harry Potter because after all, he's a, he's a you know, wonderful little boy with round glasses and a, and a magic wand, right? It's real quiet. I'll, I'll get off Harry Potter, Maybe. But, but what I'm telling you is, so we, we, what am I telling you? What, what shapes culture? See, we let, we let culture, the secular culture, we let it shape the kingdom. So what we'll do is we'll take what's happening in the world and we'll, we'll bring it into the kingdom and we'll dress it up a little bit and we'll put it on the platform because we like the smoke and the lights and the mirrors and all these kinds of things. And, and we'll, we'll clean it up and we'll put a Christian spin on it and we'll, re, we'll repackage and we'll represent it and, uh, to the church. I can't believe y'all are as quiet as you are. You're, you are scaring me. We let culture shape the kingdom. When we as a kingdom uh, should be shaping the culture around us. See, again, uh, um, knowledge informs, truth transforms. This is truth. This is truth. So we, we, it starts right here, in this spot right here, that truth is, is presented and then it's dealt with. It's either, it's either accepted or rejected. Truth is presented, it's accepted or rejected. And, and his truth hits at a heart level. So his truth will transform us if we'll allow it to, right? Be not conformed, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind. 
You know, presenting your body. A re, uh, 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 be, be, uh, brethren, uh, uh, oh, let me bring it back to me, Lord. Romans 12, 1. Therefore, brethren, uh, uh, I would that you, I beseech you, therefore, brethren, to present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable unto God, which is a reasonable service. Verse 2 says, uh, Be not conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what, that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Amen. But what I want you to understand is that the truth of God is what transforms. And, and so we have an opportunity to be transformed and then in turn to transform the culture of the society, the world in which we live. But if you're not getting in his presence and you're not uh, filling yourself with his truth, there's no transformation taking place. It's, it's confirmation, right? You're being conformed. If you're not being transformed, you're being conformed, whether you believe it or not, whether you realize it or not. If you're not being con uh, transformed, you're being conformed. So we, we, we have an opportunity to get into his presence, to hear his voice, so that we can change societies, change cultures, if you will, and, and shake nations with the presence and power of God, and yet we as a church often let it fall because we're too busy being conformed. We're, we're, we're too busy accepting and embracing the world in which we live. We're, we're not focused with the kingdom or on the kingdom. We're focused with the world around us. We get, we get too busy with the life that we're living to include him in it. I wonder, see, we, we, again, we want to see these amazing things. And I stand up here and I talk about the magnificence of God, his power that is available to us, the life that he's called us to live, the, the society that he's called us to, to, to impact, if you will. Now, there's a, there's a, um, a polarization. Uh, there's a separation, if you will where the people of God, those who have a heart after him will grow in righteousness and holiness and sanctification. And those who reject him, will it, it, the, the good get better, the wicked get more wicked. The, uh, and, and that's taking place. If I'm, I'm going to tell you, in my lifetime, I was born August 2nd, 1967. In my lifetime, the, the things that I have seen that nobody, it's, it's those things that weren't even talked about in secret, in private when I was a kid. And now not only are they flaunted, but you're berated if you won't accept it and embrace it. Right. Amen. Right. And, and, and yet we will turn a blind eye and not say anything about it because after all, we want to be, we want to be nice. We want to be nice. And we, we want to see, it's just like I was telling you a minute ago, I said we would get back to the religious leaders uh, uh, to, to, and them knowing the word of God and yet rejecting it. It's in, in, in Luke's gospel. It's in Matthew's gospel too. Matthew chapter 16. I mean, let, me, let me show you something here. Everybody okay? I'm not going to tell you you're scaring me again. But you are. Uh, Matthew 16, verse 1, Then the Pharisees and Sadducees came and testing him, asked that he would show them a sign from heaven. And he answered and said to them, When, when it's evening, you say, it'll be fair weather, for the sky is red. And in the morning, it'll be foul weather today, for the sky is red and threatening hypocrites. You know how to discern the face of the sky, but you cannot discern the signs of the time. He was rebuking them because they weren't doing what I'm talking about this morning. See, these are, these are, you know who the Pharisees and Sadducees were, right? Could have lumped the scribes in there with them, but this specifically says that it was the Pharisees and Sadducees who came to him essentially seeking a sign, prove to us, prove to us. And he said, you're smart enough to know that it's the red sky at night, sailors delight, red sky in the morning, sailor take warning. Anybody ever heard that? That's what, that's what he was telling him. You're smart enough to know that, but you can't recognize what's standing right in front of you. The Pharisees and the Sadducees could not stand one another. Anybody ever heard the expression, the enemy of my enemy is my friend? That's, that's essentially what they were operating on. The enemy of my enemy, which was Jesus, uh, is my friend. Or excuse me, the, the enemy of my enemy, um, the, the uh, Sadducees were the... Anyway, you get it. You know what I'm talking about. So... 
but, but understand that they didn't like one another at all. And, and so you had with Sadducees, they were, they were much more influential than Pharisees. Pharisees were more like those crazy uh, full gospel people, right? We don't know anything about those. But that's the Pharisees. The Sadducees were much more, they're much more refined. They, they had, uh, if, you, if you want to be accepted, you want to be accepted in society, make sure you go to church somewhere where everything happens real, you know, right? You know, anybody know what I'm talking I know you don't know what I'm talking about. But, but that's the difference between the Pharisees and Sadducees. After, after the destruction of Jerusalem, the, the Sadducees, they don't exist anymore. But the Pharisees existed long after that. And, and essentially, that's where you get your, um, all your teachers um, in Judaism. They were all Pharisees, right? Basically, the Pharisees believed in the supernatural. My grandfather used to tell me when I was a little boy, he said, and it didn't even register with me at the time, but it does now. He said, the Pharisees were a fair people and the Sadducees were a sad people. And that's just, if you don't remember anything else, just remember that. The Pharisees were a fair people and the Sadducees were a sad people. The Pharisees believed in the resurrection, the supernatural, angels. Sadducees didn't believe in anything. They, if, you, if it was, was not the Pentateuch, then pfft, they don't believe in anything. They thought that the, that was the only time that God ever moved in the earth was when he gave the Pentateuch uh, to Moses. But I, I tell you all that to tell you this. Jesus is telling them that you... you you come to me seeking a sign. And see, this is what happens in church today. In church today, you have every, every across the whole spectrum, you have people who, in essence, in church, deny the deity of Jesus. And somebody very well-known in church recently did that, and now he's backtracking. Um, his, his title rhymes with nope. <laughs> Never. There you go. Pope, yeah. Pope recently, recently rejected the deity of Jesus. And then, and then somebody called him on it and he said, no, I didn't say that. But it's actually on, recorded on videotape. So, yeah. But what I'm telling you is you have the whole spectrum when it, when it comes to church. You have people who reject the deity of Jesus. It's like it's a club to make us all feel better about ourselves because it's a mental thing anyway. Ain't no such thing, no life after death, no resurrection, none of that. It's just a club so we can feel it's, it's mental salve, if you will. Something to appease our conscience and help us get through this stinking life because, you know, praise God when it's all over. And then you have the other end of the spectrum where people walk intimately with God and, and, and yet you get, so we'll say, deniers of anything or everything. And then over here... Right here is the people walk intimately with God, but then right here you... Sorry, Cliff. <laughs> so right along in here... I'll put it back here. So right along in here you have a people who they say that they believe in the power of God. They say that uh, signs, wonders, and miracles are for us today. They believe in the power of the Holy Spirit. They say, they acknowledge all this stuff, and yet anytime anything ever happens, they say, no, 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 no. No, 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 no. No, that's not God. No, 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 no. He, he does things, but... He's not doing that. He does things, but he's not doing that either. He talks to us, but he ain't talking to you. He talks to us, but he ain't talking to him either. He ain't talking to nobody you know. Matter of fact, I don't even know of anybody he talks to, but he does talk to us. You, you see what I'm saying? So that's the Pharisees in essence, but you still have that today. You have every, every level along the spectrum. You people over here in a sad state. But every level along the spectrum, and then you actually have the people who are walking intimately with God. The Simeons. You have the Enochs, the people who walk intimately with him and hear the voice of God. And, 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 and I'm telling you something, folks, when you're walking intimately with him, the love that you have for people, and it's not just born again people, but the love that you have for people in general, to say that it's heightened is an understatement because when you're, you, you, you become like the people you hang around, right? And so when you're intimate with him, God is love. You can't help. That's why the Bible says in 1 John, by this all men will know that you are, uh, excuse me, uh, if you have not love, that you don't know God. Jesus said, by this all men will know that you are my disciples by the love that you have one for another. 1 John, in 1 John it says, if you don't have love, you don't know God. You can't say that you love him if you can't say that you love them. If you don't love them, you don't love him. Don't, and stop telling people that you do. That's essentially what John is saying. But, but what I'm telling you is, we, we, if you get intimate with him, it transforms you. And as a result of the transformation and the intimacy, you hear his voice and you know. You, you know. He, he, 
I, I just, I, I don't feel like I'm doing it justice. The, 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 the thing is, mind cannot comprehend Neither has ear heard. You, we have not begun to glimpse the surface of the good things that God has for those who love him. We're not even close. And yet, yet we're content to walk and live in such a hampered state that we're just, we're, I mean, it's like propping everything up with band-aids and duct tape and sticks and twigs and just holding it all together and all the while singing, well, good things are coming, brother. Good things are coming. And, and, and yet we have the ability, the opportunity to get in his presence and hear his voice in such a way that not only does it transform us, but it changes the world around us. It's that anointing of Issachar, discerning the times. And, and see, the, uh, again, let me read this to you again. And I'm getting ready to stop of the sons of Iskar, who had understanding of the times to know what Israel ought to do. And then it says, all their brethren were at their command. All their brethren were at their command. Th this is by design. Because I, I didn't even begin to get into... Well, never mind.